say good morning, Waves family. It, it hits a little bit different for me. Um, it's, it's special to me because I do have sisters uh, that are here today. I have some nieces that are here today, nephews, and some really good friends. And so I just want to take a, a minute to just to thank you, Pastor Mario, um, for giving me the opportunity to serve in this way. Thanks for just encouraging me and, and pushing me. Um, I really appreciate it. So let me introduce myself. My name is Fabian. I've been, uh, I've been at Waves for about 20 years, um, and currently I'm serving in the men's ministry, and then from time to time you'll see me behind that camera right there. Uh, today is my first time uh, serving in this way. Thank you. Thanks for the encouragement. Uh, I'm going to be honest with you, I'm a little bit nervous. Uh, I, I do do this, and... Uh, even though I have experience speaking in, in, in front of bigger crowds, you'll see uh, my hand shaking. Uh, it's just a thing that happens. And recently, as I was practicing, even Pastor Mario said, baby, you, you slap your leg, too. And I didn't know that. And so I just want to tell you that it's just, it's my nerves. It's natural. Um, I'm not having a medical emergency. No, no need to call 911. It's just something that happens. Just like... Just like when I go into academy for one thing and I come out with all this extra fishing gear, it's just something that's going to happen. <laughs> and so before we go to the Lord in prayer, I just want us to, to say my two points. Uh, I hope that as I'm speaking and, and sharing these stories with you this morning, that you'll remember those two points, that they'll, that they'll be in the front of your mind. Number one is that the enemy, Satan, the enemy knows we're sinners. The enemy knows we're sinners and he wants us to stay in the shame of that sin so that we can remain separated from God. God knows we're sinners too. God knows we're sinners, but he loves us. He wants to wipe away that sin so that we can draw near to him. Amen. So at this time, let's, let's go to the, commit this time to the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for today, Lord. Thank you for the way that you move, Father God. Thank you for this opportunity, Father God. Lord, I just, I just give this time to you, Lord. I ask that you just help me get out of my own way, Lord. I pray that the things that I want to be seen for, the things that I want to be known about, Lord, that they're aside and that today that we see you, Lord, that we see your beautiful truth, Lord, that we hear your voice speaking today. Father, again, I just thank you and I ask that you be with us, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so today I'm going to be sharing about Psalm 51. Let me tell you how we got here. Um, I remember it was a little over a month ago. Thank you. A little over a month ago, uh, Mario sent me this text, and he's like, what is your favorite psalm? I was like scratching my head. Like, what is he, what is he talking about? And Pastor Mario, he does this. I remember even further back, we were in a meeting, and he's like, who is Jesus? And you're like, what? Like, it's not a trick question. He's just trying to get you thinking. And so when he asked me, what is your favorite song? I was like, uh, all of them, Pastor. Of course, they're all, they're all my favorite. Um, and so in Belize, he, you know, he said, hey, let's, let's set aside some time. Go ahead and pick your psalm, and I'll help you organize your thoughts, and we'll kind of talk through, you know, what is God revealing to you. And so I did do some studies on psalms while we were there, but I really didn't. I, was, I think I was kind of putting it off. I was a little bit scared. I didn't know, you know, I wanted to pick something good, and um, thankfully, we don't have to rely on our own power all the time. God is good, amen? And so God brought Psalm 51, and as I was studying Psalm 51 and reading it and kind of listening to it, one verse in particular stuck out to me, um, and it says, behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. And so the writer of Psalm 51 is David, King David. And so David, at this point, he's like he's contrite. In Psalm 51, he's, he's, he's in anguish, right? He's confessing to God. And so as David is, is coming back to God, he's realizing that God takes truth in the, takes pleasure in the truth in a person's soul. God takes pleasure when we're open to him when we're honest with him, when we confess our sins to him, and we, when we repent because of him. 
And so I'm going to share with you a little bit about my, my testimony. Um, and as I do, remember what I said. God, the, Satan, the enemy, wants to keep us in the shame of our sin so that we can remain separated from God. And so 20, it was over 20 years ago, I remember I was sitting at Benbrook Lake. It was the 4th of July. It was a Saturday. And I was with my family, and we were enjoying time at the lake, and I had a beer in my hand. So this is water, by the way. <laughs> I had a beer in my hand, and my nephew, who's here today, Eric, Marquez, he asked me, he said, Theo, I'm going to get baptized tomorrow. I'd like you to come and see me. And so I was like, yes, of course, I'll be there. And so I remember this was when Waves was in the south part of Fort Worth. And I remember going in there and hearing the word, the message. And I was like, man, how does a pastor know my life? This was one of those turning points for me where God just spoke to me. And I was like, okay, something's, something's happening. Fast forward like a month and a half later, and, and Waves at that time had a, was doing a believer service. And at that service, uh, we were doing the Lord's Supper. And I remember the pastor at the time, he, he was telling a story about Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. And I remember like that was turning point number two for me. That pierced my heart. And I was, and I was broken in that moment. And I walked out of the church crying. And the pastor at the time, he comes out to me. And he, he's consoling me. And he's explaining to me. And he leads me to salvation. I remember receiving Christ that day. So these were two turning points for me, and I was, I had an encounter with Christ. God was reaching out to me, but even throughout that time, I was still in my flesh. I was still wanting to live the way that I wanted to live. Fast forward years later, years later, um, it was a St. Patty's Day parade. I remember it. I remember it well. Um, Leading up to that day, I, I was drinking just more and more and just making more and more selfish choices. And on this day, we started partying since like 8 in the morning. I had my first drink and drunk all the way to in the evening. And my behavior was just getting more and more out of hand. And I was at my friend Robert's house. He's sitting right there. And uh, I'd come out of his bathroom, and, and I remember him coming up to me, and he, he's like, bro, you need to chill. He said, uh... He said, you, you need to chill. I remember him saying, man, like, don't do this. He, he reminded me, he said, this is not who you are, Fabian. And so I remember in that moment, I was like, okay, bro, everything's good. This is what I said on the outside, but on the inside, I remember feeling convicted. I remember knowing he was right. So as I'm doing this study and preparing, I, I just realized how rare of a friend he is. Right. And so, Robert, I know I've told you in person before and I told you over text, man, but I just I need to say this now. I love you. And just thank you, man, for being just an upright person. Thank you for being an upright person and calling me out and, and nudging me in the right direction. I really appreciate it. Um, and so as I was doing this study, like I said, I realized how rare of a friend that is. And I can't help but ask myself, like, Fabian, what kind of friend have you been? And I failed many times in that way. And so I would ask you, church, what kind of friend have you been? Are you that rare friend, church? Are you that rare friend, family? Are you that rare friend that will stand up right and say, hey, bro, don't, don't do it? Or, hey, girl, that's not who you are. Or are you like me sometimes? Are you that friend who kind of cheers and cheers on friends in their sin or encourages them in their bad behavior? I remember as an early Christian, you know, we were in that party time and you were just like chug, 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 drink, drink, drink. Um, or maybe you're that friend who is like, you're in a group of guys and one of them was like, bro, I hooked up with so-and-so and we're just like, really? You know, you want to hear the details instead of saying, Doing what is right, doing what God's called us to do instead of saying, no, that's not who you are. My prayer that today is that as I share these stories, as I share my testimony, it touches you in some way. And so again, I just want to remind you, remember what I said. The enemy knows we're all sinners and he wants us to stay in the shame of that sin so that we can remain separated from God. 
And God knows we're all sinners, but he wants to wipe that sin away so that we can draw near to him. And so as we continue to share, as I continue to share, I pray that you hear God's voice this morning. I pray that together we see God's beautiful truth. And so moving forward, let me read uh, verses one and two in Psalm 51. It says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me of my sin. So this is David. David's the author in Psalm 51. And if you remember last week, Pastor Eddie was talking about David being anointed by God, being called by God. And so David is at the point here. He's already king. He's already committed this, this really bad sin. And at this point where he's, where he's writing this, David has publicly accepted his sin. I say publicly because it didn't start out that way, right? David is trying to cover up his sin. He tries to create this alternative narrative about what happened. And so let me tell you the story about David. It's, if you want to look it up, and I encourage you to go and read it, it's in 2 Samuel chapter 11. I'm going to share with you the story of David and, and this sin, and, and, and it's about David and Bathsheba. And so David, by this point, he's the king. And this one day he walks out on his balcony, and he looks out, and he sees Bathsheba, and she's taking a bath, and he sees her naked body. And you can imagine that lust already starts to build in his heart. And so David being king, he sends his men out to get her, bring her to him, and David lays with Bathsheba. That's a nice way of just saying he commits adultery. And so David, remember just last week we were learning how David is a man after God's own heart. So David's committed this sin. He's committed adultery. Maybe he's thinking like, okay, I... I got away with it, no big deal. Later, Bathsheba sends word back to David that she's pregnant. And so now David has to do something. Maybe he could own up to it, but he, he just doesn't. Remember what I said, the enemy wants us to keep us separated. He wants to keep us in the shame of that sin so we can remain separated from God. And so what does David do? He tries to cover up that sin. Bathsheba is the wife of Uriah, who's one of David's elite soldiers. And so he calls Uriah home from battle and he tells Uriah, hey, go, go be with your wife. And David's probably thinking, okay, Uriah will go be with his wife and the fact that she's pregnant, no big deal. But no, Uriah, I imagine him just being the soldier. He's like, no, my, my, my men are out at battle. He's just not, he doesn't do it. And so once again, for the second time, David tries to cover up his sin. He calls Uriah and he gets him drunk. He gets him drunk and he figures, okay, I'll get him. He's going to be drunk. He's going to go be with her and then she'll, he'll find out she's proud. Okay, I'm covered. But Uriah's like, no, it doesn't work. And so for the third time, David tries to cover up his sin. He continues to take matters in his own hands and he sends Uriah to the front lines where no big surprise, he gets killed. And so, it's really crazy when you think about like all the things that David does. And it's like this, this really sinister plan that he's executing, but it's really not that different than the things that we do. I, I really do. I think we do similar things when we when we tell stories about ourselves, whether in public or in private, we paint ourselves to be the hero. We downplay our sin or our mistakes. It's either like just outright intentional like David or just as we're telling these stories about a situation or an incident, we start to make ourselves and people, yeah, yeah. And so you're like, yeah, that's what happened. That, that, that's it. And it becomes, instead of being true about, like us being honest about what we've done, we, we start to go, yeah, yeah, that's what happened. The facts land together differently and it makes us look better. And so we just like, yeah, that's what it is. And so how does this happen? As a fisherman, I'm a fisherman. And so this is, it starts off innocently enough, right? You're a fisherman, you catch a fish, you're by yourself, I've done it. 
And then when I go and tell about that fish, I'm like, yeah, it was big, bro. <laughs> and I tell the story again and again, and somehow that fish just gets enormous. If you can't do that, if you're a fisherman, you're with other guys, and they're there with you, and you get a fish on the line, and you're fighting it for a little bit, and the line breaks. That wasn't a tree you were stuck on, bro. That had to be a 10-pounder, bro. That was the big one. And so these are just the little small ways that it starts, right? Or maybe it's more serious. Maybe we want to indulge our selfish ways or, we, or we're mad at our spouse. We're fighting with her and we just want to say like, hey, I know she's cheating on me. I know she's doing wrong. And we tell ourselves this fake story because that's what it is. It's a fake story so that we can go do what we want to do. Now, if we convince ourselves that that's what it is, we can go and, and talk to that girl and we can buy her a drink and we can dance with her. We can do all the selfish things that we want to do. Sometimes we end relationships, right? We're in a fight with somebody, a disagreement. And we won't up to, own up to our part. We won't like, make that effort of peace. Even though there's a peace that could happen, we, we say it's not me, it's them. They're crazy, it's, it's their fault, it's not mine. We might even say something like, I have nothing to apologize for. Maybe at work we steal something, something big or something small, but we just take it. We take it and we just think like, I deserve it. They're not paying me anyway, like I deserve this. I'm, I'm gonna get what's mine. It's crazy to think what, what David had done, what he'd gotten away with, Time has, has passed, right? If you, if you look at um, from the time that David committed his sin until the baby's actually come, it had been about a year. And so remember what I said earlier. God knows we're sinners. He doesn't want to leave us in sin. He wants to wipe away that sin so that he can draw near to us. And so now I'm going to tell you about David and Nathan. I'm going to encourage you to read the story is in 2 Samuel chapter 12. Uh, I'm going to kind of summarize it for you. And so it's been a year. David laid with Bathsheba. She's had the baby. Uriah is dead. And in that year, the devil's winning because David is staying in the shame of that sin. It's hidden. It's not public. But thankfully, God doesn't want to leave David there. God doesn't want to leave David in his mess. I'm really encouraged by this story because it's hard to think why. Like, why would you be encouraged by what David did? Hey, look, he's a sinner. I'm a sinner. We're all sinners. But God loves us, and he doesn't want to leave us in our mess, and he doesn't leave David in his mess either. Dave, God sends Nathan to David. God knows David. He knows that David's heart is hardened a bit. And so Nathan, he comes before David, and he tells him the story about this rich person, this rich man who has many lamb. He, he says he has many lamb. And so, and then there's a poor man who has just one lamb that's precious to him. And so a traveler comes to visit and this rich man, rather than use one of his own lamb, he takes the poor man's lamb. And the second he hears that story, David's like, he's guilty. He's guilty. We need to punish him. And that's when Nathan this upright man, this trusted advisor, he's able to call out David and he says, David, you are the sinner. You are the guilty one. You, what you've done with Uriah and Bathsheba, it's wrong, David. And David finally is accepting it. It's funny how like on the outside, like David is one way, but we can see the inside of his heart. If we read Psalm 51, you can hear David's heart. You can hear his contrition. You can hear him. You can hear his gut-wrenching cry. So, knowing what we know about David and knowing what we know about ourselves, knowing what David tries to cover up and knowing what we try to cover up about ourselves, think about this, how the stories we tell ourselves are one way
The story we tell about ourselves is one way, but really it's another. And so at this time, I'm going to ask that we, if we could bring down the house lights. Uh, I'm going to say, don't worry, you're going to be safe, right? We're with family in here. And so as, as we sit together, as you sit, I'm going to ask do, to do what's comfortable to you. I'm going to ask that some of us close our eyes and then some of us keep them open. Again, you can, you can do what's comfort, comfortable to you. Together, as we sit in darkness, I'm going to ask you to consider your own life. Consider your testimony. Consider the choices that you made in your life. The stories that you tell yourself, the stories that you tell about yourself. Some of us, as we sit in darkness, separate from God, we don't know our sin. We just don't know. Our hearts and our eyes are closed to God. We don't know a relationship with our Savior, Jesus Christ. Maybe we think just God is just too busy. We don't know God's call for our life because maybe because of our upbringing, we, we didn't go to church or we went to a different church. We don't know that Jesus loves us because, because of hurts, we just, we just can't believe it's possible. Maybe somebody hurt you. They hurt you and you feel broken. You don't feel that there's no value in you. You feel like you're garbage, that you're trash, that you're worth it. But I promise you, church, you're not. I promise you, God is not too busy. That even if you don't know Christ, even if you've never been in church, God has a call for your life and you can begin that relationship with him right now, church. I promise you that Jesus loves you. I promise you that you matter. I promise despite whatever happened in your life, whatever hurt you're experiencing, God wants to heal that hurt. God wants to forgive your sin. God wants to draw close to you. Some of us, as we sit in darkness separate from God, we know our sin. We know it very well. We know maybe that we're not a good parent, that we choose us over the kids sometimes. We know we're not a good spouse. We just ignore their wants and needs and we act selfishly. If you're a young person, maybe you just ignore your parents. You think, I know best. Sometimes we indulge our flesh with pornography We might think, man, I'm not hurting anyone. Or we indulge our lustful fantasies. We think, I deserve this. I just want to feel good right now. But I promise you, church, God knows we're all still sinners. That's what I said earlier. God knows we are all sinners, but we'll wipe away that sin so that we can draw near to him. As you sit and and ponder, I want to offer you, church, family, friends, I want to offer you the free gift of salvation. This is the most important decision of your life. What you decide today, what you decide here and now matters beyond these moments. It matters beyond today because it matters for all eternity. And so now I want to tell you that I want to offer you that gift of salvation, church, but you you have to receive it. 
Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That means all of us. We're all sinners. But even though we're sinners, God still loves us. Romans 5.8 says, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died on the cross for us despite us being in sin. He wants to draw us near to him, and so he sent his son to die on the cross for us. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. John 14.6 says, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. And so I ask you, church, will you receive the free gift of salvation? I pray that you do. I hope that you do. My heart yearns that you would receive it. If you do that, then Psalm 51, Psalm 51 is relatable. Psalm 51 means something. We can have kinship with David, like we can be there with him as he cries to God. We can understand that Psalm 51 isn't just this thing that David said, right? Because he got busted and now he's just doing, saying whatever he has to say to get out of it. No. So at this time, I'm going to pray. I'm going to ask you to join me in prayer. I'm going to pray Psalm 51 over us. Let's pray. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Father, only you can do that. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Father, take it away as you promised. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me, Father God. I can't deny it. I won't deny it anymore, Lord. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in our words and blameless on your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Father, we're all sinners. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Father God, no matter how I try, I can't do it alone. I need you. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones of your... Let the bones that you have broken rejoice, Father. Your sacrifice, sending your son on the cross, will not go back void, Father God. I receive this gift of salvation. Hide your face from my sins, Father, and blot out my iniquities. Please, God. I need you to do this because I can't, Lord. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Help me to think in different ways, God, in your ways, not in the old ways that I used to. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me, Father. I need it. I need it today and I need it every day. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with the willing spirit. Then... I will teach transgressors your ways, God, and I pray that sinners will return to you. Father, deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. Lord, open up my lips and my mouth will declare your praise, Father God. I won't be quiet anymore about what you've done for me. I won't be quiet anymore about how you saved me, Father. For you will not delight in sacrifice or I would give it. You will not be pleased with the burnt offering, Father God. All these fake things that I do to try to make right with you, Lord, help me to not do them anymore. Father, help me to do what you called me to do. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken contrite heart, oh God, you will not despise. 
Father, I know you take pleasure in who we really are, that we're open with you, that we're honest with you, Father. Help us to set aside these outward things that we try to do and just focus on our relationship with you, God. Do good in, do good to Zion and in your good pleasure, build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in right sacrifices and burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then will, bulls will be offered at your altar, Father God. Lord, I just pray for my family here today, Lord. Everyone in this room, Father God, I pray that we're able to hear you this morning, Father God. I pray that we, able, we were able to see your beautiful truth, Father God. Father, I pray that you continue to walk with us beyond this church hour, Father God. I pray that you continue to walk with us outside of these buildings, Lord. I pray that we are not the same anymore. I pray that we recognize the schemes of the devil, Father God, that wants to keep us separated from you, God. And I'm thankful that you don't leave us in our mess, God. That you send Nathans, that you send good friends around us to call us out, Father God. And I pray for the strength to answer that call and come back to you, Father. Thank you, Lord, for walking with us, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the sacrifice you did on the cross. Father, we just thank you and we, we praise you, Father. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.